So model intercomparison can often look like a beauty contest in the weather and uh, prediction business where you get to do weather prediction every day several times and immediately uh, gets to be uh, validated against what people actually experience in, especially in terms of uh, heavy rain events, droughts, uh, storms, uh, hurricane landing, uh, st intensification rates, etc. So there are well-known models that uh, have a better track record and others keep competing and there is a direct comparison of uh, same events again and again whereas in the climate and uh, earth system models uh, it's not uh, that uh, easy because El Nino happens every few years and uh, every model uh, obviously faces this challenge every few years and if they miss it they have to figure out why they miss it and they get four years to several years to sit and uh, hear that their model failed and so on. But in the meantime the demand for reliable predictions and projections uh, obviously will keep growing and this means depicting uncertainties is going to be critical. We'll return to this in the context of the IPCC projections a little bit later on but this is showing the schematic of uh, coupling in the uh, uh, version of the Hadley Center's uh, global uh, environmental model it's called version 1 and version 2 and this is along the lines of the earth system model versus uh, climate model so this model has uh, climate greenhouse effect greenhouse gases by geochemistry ecosystems fire aerosols water cycle and so on whereas the uh, newer version obviously has more links and more boxes with human emissions coming in uh, uh, in terms of greenhouse gases as well as aerosols as well as chemistry and land use change uh, as uh, ecosystem impacts so this becomes not only more realistic but also more uh, uh, complex especially with water withdrawals from human beings not only for agriculture but for domestic energy production and and uh, transportation, the idea of uh, growing grains and exporting them or bottling uh, water and uh, uh, various uh, uh, beverages and exporting them and so on. So does complexity necessarily mean more uh, realism? That depends on how you track uncertainties, especially when you uh, uh, consider uh, socioeconomic uh, activities like water use and land use and human emissions and so on. So you are combining now the socioeconomic sphere with the uh, physical natural uh, sphere. So you have to be sure that the depiction of uncertainties and tracking of uncertainties is done uh, very carefully. So that doesn't mean models should not be compared. There is a very uh, great need to in fact quantify uncertainties by comparing models as we will see in terms of the ensembles for example. Um, so horses, horses for courses, no model is best uh, as we already stated before depending on how much detail of the description is involved and what kind of integration of the system is involved. You have simple conceptual models, what we called before as energy budget models. Um, you have the Earth system models of intermediate complexity, which can be run for a long time, but they are very coarse resolution typically and simplified in many ways, as we will see. And then we are talking about comprehensive models now being used for uh, IPCC projections. Okay. Another way that is shown typically by Marty Clausen and uh, people like that is looking at number of interacting components in the system with box models sitting here uh, with uh, grid cells uh, in the atmosphere, ocean and actually should involve land as well. And there are various models like Burn uh, 2.5 dimensional model, Climber model which we will look at in a little bit more detail. So you can see that it's uh, cumulative dimension and it's uh, 
grid cells versus the number of components it stands here here and then genie is another model that actually it, uh, even couples the ocean sediments and the sediment transport and so on uh, to do uh, simulations like the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum and potential perturbations of the clathrates and so on okay so that's just depicting what we already saw and in terms of the in, in, uh, information demand, um, this concept of the uncertainty well uh, is uh, kind of important in my mind at least. Uh, we are talking about uncertainty and the uncertainty actually depends on who is uh, perceiving this uncertainty. If you are a model developer and a model uh, doing the model simulations yourself you have a sense of uncertainty that's let's say somewhere here just on it on this qualitative scale so you are the information developer modeler or technology developer and then there are experienced overcritical users could be uh, decision makers for disaster management, could be banks using ENSO predictions for deciding on investments, loans, uh, insurance companies and so on. So they take the forecasts uh, and they uh, depict it as if they already have much higher confidence. If for example there is a forecast of a, a hurricane season that's going to be more active then insurance companies get into action and start uh, deciding various things about premiums and uh, calculating damages and uh, observing uh, losses and so on and so forth uh, or uh, bankers giving uh, loans to fishermen saying El Nino is coming even though prediction may be only for 60 percent chance of El Nino etc. But if you are far away from the information production like an alienated under critical end user uh, who have the tendency to follow uh, believe the brochure concept uh, you know obviously we all depend on the information we get on from various uh, sources uh, farmers may depend more on the information coming from government agencies than uh, private uh, entities and so on so Information needs to be timely and relevant, but also simplified enough for decision making. And there is no time to say you have to wait. Okay, so within that, we have things like fast uh, system models, which have full complexity but much, much lower resolution. So they can do uh, full uh, transitional. Uh, tran uh, transient run sorry going all the way back to the last uh, interglacial for example uh, and looking at uh, greenhouse gas forcing only orbital forcing only ice sheets only and compare with data from Epica Dome to see what produces uh, the accurate uh, the best simulation so you can see the all forcings and Epica Dome are the closest compared to these other uh, forces m forcing missing and this is from Greenland the same model for the same period and you can see that the Greenland has much higher variability presumably related to the great differences in the ocean circulation around Antarctica versus Greenland Greenland has the uh, Atlantic uh, the Gulf Stream coming up and bringing warm waters and interacting with the Arctic circulation and creating all sorts of uh, land interactions from the western side of uh, North American uh, continent and so on so its variability has got much higher uh, uh, time scales uh, with the millennial time scales being much more prominent than in Antarctica and remember as we said before these uh, Danskard Ushker events or, or the stadial interstadials and the colder Heinrich events and so on, they are not fully explained. The data is not enough to fully understand in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas forcing, orbital forcing, and ice sheet only ice albedo interactions and so on. So these are the challenges we face uh, when we uh, have a range of models uh, and choose the horse based on which course uh, 
uh, is best for that horse but still you can have process uncertainties parameter uncertainties what are called aleatoric or random uncertainties and just irreducible uncertainties uh, in terms of just missing process understanding and the chaotic behavior of this nonlinear uh, system which uh, is intrinsically limited in the in its predictability okay so we will look later on what we mean by predictability so when we want to let's say do decadal predictions we need to know where the predictability may come from okay so we'll look at that